All right. Hello, David. Welcome back to the podcast. How you doing? Yeah, really good. Yeah, thanks for having me again. <laughs> yeah, super glad that you're back here to talk about your brand new book. And I had the opportunity to read an early copy and loved it. So it's called The Expectation Effect. Can you let us know what it's about and kind of like what inspired you to dive into this topic? Yeah, sure. So The Expectation Effect is about all of these kind of self-fulfilling prophecies that we create in our lives where our beliefs about an event or what's going to happen actually become true. Um, now that sounds a bit like kind of pseudoscience, it could sound a bit like The Secret or that kind of book, yeah, you know, on yeah. kind of vague positive thinking, but actually this is completely grounded in real science, you know, I, I cite something like 470 papers at least in the, uh, to back, back this up, and it's really like these expectation effects are all based on like kind of known plausible uh, physiological and behavioral mechanisms, so you know, I'm not claiming that this is like um that you can just think yourself rich and money will come to you but I'm talking about things like the placebo effect in medicine which mm -hmm. is very well known but we now know that actually uh similar responses can be seen in our kind of everyday health and well-being from our responses to exercise to our responses to a new diet even to how we age they can all be influenced quite powerfully by our beliefs yeah, yeah. I uh, a while back, I think I mentioned this in my review of the book. I had Eric Vance on to talk about uh, suggestible you, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, how much more is David going to go into? And and like you mentioned, you had so many studies and research. I like I was learning even more. And one of the first things I, I wanted to ask you to like when you're when you do this much research, learning about it, right? Does it? Do you think like that type of stuff affects the expectation effect? Right. Like since you know about it, like you talk a little bit about how you've adopted it, you know, in certain aspects of your life. But how does that affect that aspect by knowing? You know, I think it's actually really powerful. And that is actually what I love about all of this research is that when we're talking about expectation effects, we're not talking about kind of deceiving people. But it's actually mm -hmm. just kind of explaining the science behind these effects and kind of getting people to open their minds to the possibility that they're current beliefs might not be totally objective and then they might be able to shift them in a different direction to bring about some benefits um that that knowledge in itself can be really powerful um and so that's what i found just reading all of this research is like i don't have to kind of uh, say some kind of mantra to kind of you know force myself to believe something that isn't true like i've seen the studies i know that if i um I know that my perceptions of my fitness are going to shape how well I do and that actually some of those responses can be more powerful than the effects of my actual genes and then by knowing that I can just kind of start to question some previous assumptions so for example you know in um, gym classes at school I uh, you know I found them quite difficult like I was very small for my age all of that kind of thing so I kind of had built up all of these underlying assumptions about my fitness and then seeing this body of scientific research showing that those assumptions are actually shaping my fitness now well then I can just reappraise those assumptions and wonder if I could take a bit more of an objective view and that in itself is then really powerful so it's all about almost looking at ourselves and our abilities more like a scientist and trying to abandon assumptions and then try to reframe them in a way that could be potently useful and so yeah I think that kind of understanding the science there actually kind of creates the ability to kind of change those beliefs yeah yeah one of the things uh you talk about in there like you have a whole section on like stress and anxiety and that, I think that's uh one place where you and I connect like I I've dealt with anxiety my entire life and I remember you know a few years ago I think that's when I first kind of learned about you know uh, this this type of research and everything like that, but you discuss a little bit of like reframing, right? That that like anxiety, like going into a situation, whether it's like a job interview or doing a presentation, and you know, and and how you know the science shows that if we just change it from like I'm worried, I'm nervous, I'm stressed to like this kind of excitedness. Like, have you have you been able to use that since like researching this book? Have you like brought that into different situations and? Has it worked out for you with your kind of anxiety or nervousness? Yeah, all the time. I mean, I think the most obvious example for me would be in public speaking, which mm. um, say for my first book, like I managed to get through that without, you know, any problems. But like, I wouldn't say it was an easy experience. Um, but then I think researching this book, I kind of uh, came to realize that, uh, like you said, that there, uh, there are kind of two views of anxiety that you could have. So 
one is that it's kind of debilitating and that if you're feeling nervous that in itself is like a sign of weakness and you have to suppress that feeling mm. if you're going to perform well and if you fail to suppress that feeling which is really likely then you're going to perform badly um reading the research i realized that actually that can be true but a lot of those effects aren't inevitable from the feelings themselves they're created by the expectations and what you can see from the research is that actually there's a whole other group of people who still feel anxious before they perform but they see that anxiety as a kind of energy you know it kind of mm. gives a little bit of an edge to their performance and um and that by viewing it like that that in itself then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and they do perform better and they you know feel less they feel that anxiety is kind of less unpleasant it's just a bit more they're more comfortable in that anxiety and mm -hmm. so i applied that it didn't even take much effort because like i said once you've read the research it kind of becomes a no-brainer almost and um and yeah i found it really worked and I, I think like also my experience really showed me something important about the expectation effect which is like you don't expect miracles to emerge immediately mm -hmm. with this it's like anything you're kind of learning to think in a different way so it helped yeah. a little bit in my first talk that I gave and then helped a bit more in the next one and over time it kind of developed so that now I actually quite enjoy giving presentations mm -hmm. um but that didn't happen overnight it was something that you know I had to practice yeah so I I think that's you know something interesting to touch on right because like we were talking about like what inspired the book and so you have like you have books like The Secret and this kind of like, you know, manifestation and, you know, uh, this this idea that, you know, if we just think it, it'll come true and all this. So how do we separate that? Because in the book, you talk about some other kind of like self affirmations and there's a, you know, there's a whole section on like intelligence. Right. And, you know, you, you had your, you know, your last book kind of talking about intelligence as well. But what what do you see as a difference between kind of this like uh like faux like kind of pseudo scientific -y, uh just self-affirmation type thing that doesn't really do anything and then like you know reframing our stress into excitement or uh having like that growth mindset rather than the fixed mindset how do we separate those two so say a listener is like okay what's the good stuff versus the bad stuff you know what i mean I mean, I think like uh, primarily I'd say the difference is whether you actually have like a study showing that it's possible <laughs> yeah. or not. But I mean, that is kind of, you know, what I based the whole, my whole premise was like, you know, I wouldn't say anything that's not supported by studies. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that's the one thing, but I would say more generally, like I think what the researchers and what I have been careful to do is just to try to explore the limits of our kind of, uh, of what this can achieve and you know actually we do find that it all depends on kind of context and kind of um you know like plausibility in a yeah. way so like you know one of the things that I think is really toxic is this idea that like positive thinking can cure you of something like cancer and it can't because there's no mm -hmm. there's no biological mechanism by which your brain could um shrink a tumor like we, well we just don't know of any mechanism and there's no evidence that that can yeah. happen you know when you look at controlled trials like it can't but that doesn't mean that actually your brain isn't having any effect on your physiology it's having loads of effects it's just that some you know that particular thing is too bad it's too too big and too difficult to achieve um mm -hmm. but say we do know you know all the, like this is so well established that like the way you appraise an emotion will change like your horm hormonal response for instance mm. or the kind of um changes to your circulation you know whether your blood flow is kind of reaching your limbs and kind of helping to power your muscles or whether it's kind of concentrated in your core because you're scared that you're going to get injured mm. and so you know that can help change your short-term performance actually in something like a sports event or you know even something yeah. like public speaking but um so that is you know that's not like miraculous that's just the way the brain and body evolved to function so yeah I think yeah. that's the distinction really it's like we're not asking for like something that's magical here we're just like looking at things that we already know that there's this interaction between the brain and the body and then it's just like looking at kind of practical ways that we can make the most of that for our own benefit
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think what's helped me out the most, like since I really just got into like reading and learning and all these other things, is uh, just like the evolutionary reasons behind things, right? Like mm -hmm. evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology. Like when I understand why our brains and bodies kind of developed in these ways, then like I'm geared more towards the more sciencey stuff, right? Like you know, like stuff like The Secret and they talk about like a vision board and like putting like a mansion and money in a car. It's like, okay, well, we didn't evolve for us to like look at a vision board, but can yeah. you can you kind of break that down? You, you discuss it a little bit early on in the book to like build a foundation on this. Why did our, our brains evolve as this sort of like prediction machine to kind of get our bodies ready or in a certain state and kind of have like physiological changes within us? Yeah, I mean, it's all about adaptability and actually like, I you know, I think like our prediction machines are especially advanced, but actually, you know, like most creatures, like especially most mammals, I'm sure birds as well, have to be able to preempt what's going to happen. You know, like if they see a predator coming, their body has to like respond instantly to that threat. Um, mm -hmm. That's a form of kind of predictive processing. Uh, similarly, you know, if they, if an animal um, is, you know, like expecting uh not to have enough food or whatever then it has to be able to slow its mm. metabolism otherwise it's going to starve more quickly before it can actually get food you know so this is like essential for our survival i think what makes humans um special is that we have all of these tools like language um mm. you know we're more socially perceptive to like the kind of um context of the people around us you know and the uh, what they're communicating to us that means that actually like our the brain's predictions can be shaped by a huge number of factors and also we have more detailed memories that might be feeding into this prediction machine so uh, but essentially yeah the brain just has to be able to like form predictions to for instance to be able to like uh, allow us to kind of adapt to like a, a threat or or to adapt to like a more positive challenge. So, you know, mm -hmm. running away from a predator compared to like uh, running towards the kind of um, deer that you're trying to hunt, you know, like yeah. it's quite similar responses in the body, but also subtly different because one is protecting you from injury and the other is trying to maximize your physical performance, you know? So yeah, I just think like it, it's, we, we evolved to do this, to be able to, to adapt to any situation that's in front of us. And, with all of these tools like language, we are now ab able to kind of just shape those predictions and feed into them in ways that can be helpful for us. Yeah, yeah, and you know, part of that too, and we talk, uh, you talk about like, you know, the fight or flight response and like the fear mechanisms. And, you know, <laughs> this is very relatable to me right now because you, you discuss a little bit about like kind of how something like exposure therapy might help. So, so quick little story for the reader or the listeners who aren't up to date. So I've been dealing with a rat problem and I'm recording this in a hotel room, right? But the first sign, the first sign of a rat, I noticed that my anxiety was through the roof. Like afterwards, after we got rid of it, it went out over our balcony, we managed to get it outside. But I noticed that my my anxiety was just like up just for like an hour afterwards. And I'm sitting there thinking like, why is this happening? Like, why am I so anxious about this? And you know, uh, there's evolutionary reasons. Like there's certain things, like if we even think that we saw a snake out of the corner of our eyes, we like jump and, you know, and all that. But anyways, anyways, since I've been dealing with this problem for so long now, like I saw a rat, you know, before moving in here and like, I'm fine with it. Right. So it's kind of like getting used to it. So anyways, what I'm, what I'm getting at is how does our brain kind of adapt and turn you know, fear into something that's a little bit more normalized. Like, why does exposure therapy help changing this sort of prediction machine that we have in our brain, in our head? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, um, so I think that that's another sign of ad adaptability in a way, because I think like, you know, we have all of these connotations of rats that like they're dangerous, they're carrying, I mean, like, I think they can actually be physically dangerous. Yeah, know, yeah, like I'm not playing with it, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But also, you know, that they carry disease. So we have this kind of disgust response. But what exposure therapy is doing is over, you know, each time you see one and you emerge unscathed, it's kind of just adapting that prediction machine, recalibrating it. So, you know, that actually, 
you still have to be cautious, but you don't have to be as scared as you would have been before. Maybe you don't have to pump so much adrenaline into your body because you know that it's maybe not as bad as you saw. Um, in a way, that is just like um, a kind of exposure therapy is a very basic way of reframing the mm. feeling of threat that you had. And I guess then when we're talking about like uh, the benefits of reframing our stress, um, our views of stress or whatever, that's almost like even a more sophisticated way of doing that for situations that are maybe more less uh, kind of, um, how could I put it? Like, you know, like I think of the seeing a rat is quite, you have got a primitive response to it. Yeah. But whereas like maybe talking, public speaking is something that's more kind of um, socially nuanced maybe. Mm. So yeah, so I guess that's, they're all on a continuum, but I think what each thing is doing, each step that you take in either case, it's just like recalibrating like the brain's predictions of what threat it's facing or what challenge it's facing mm -hmm. and what it can do to kind of adapt the body to respond in the best, most efficient and most um, efficacious way possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, it's it's really been interesting, um, you know, because I've, I've tried to be very mindful of that, that type of stuff. And just like, for example, public speaking was something terrible for, you know, for me as well. And I used to work at a rehab and, you know, they tossed me in there. They're like, oh, yeah, by the way, you're going to be doing groups in front of like anywhere from like 50 to 100 people. And I'm like, wait, what? Right. And at first it was terrible. And then I started getting used to it. I started getting excited for it and all that just as I started doing it more and more and more. And I try to challenge challenge myself and do new things and all that. Um, but one thing I, I was really interested in uh, talking with you about, and we could spend the, the whole time talking about this, is medications, right? Like the placebo effect and all this. So something uh, that I, I read about and started really diving into was the placebo effects and medications and specifically antidepressants. And then I started learning more and more about it, right? So you know, with antidepressants, I started learning that, you know, with a lot of the studies they've been doing, it's hard to account for how much the medication's working versus the actual placebo effect, right? But, you know, uh, as a recovering opioid addict, like I was addicted to pain medications, it's been really interesting learning about how pain medications, and since our brain naturally creates certain chemicals that help alleviate pain, like, that can help as well. So there's a lot of like ethical questions <laughs> around, you know, medications and do we do we tell people or do or do we not? And you touch on this a bit in the book. So can you kind of discuss that and what what they're researching as far as placebo effects and some of the ethical questions? Because there's like informed consent, right? Like how much does this medication actually work and all that and all that stuff. It's just really it seems really tricky and nuanced for me. Yeah, no, it is. And I think like what you touch on is really important, which is the fact that in the past, like we associated placebos with deception. And it seemed like the only way we could benefit from the placebo effect was if we kind of fooled people into thinking they were receiving a real medication when they weren't. Um, but actually, like what the new and really cutting edge research is doing is showing that deception isn't necessary. Um, so one one thing that I find really promising is this idea of open label placebos. And mm. what the researchers did was that they uh, kind of gave people these, um, well, first of all, they educated people about the mind-body connection. And they told them things that have been proven scientifically, such mm. as the fact that when you receive a placebo pill, believing it's a pain medication, that that can cause the brain to produce its own endogenous painkillers so you're yeah. actually having a physiological effect from your expectation mm -hmm. um and then they gave so they told people about that and then they gave people a jar of um pills that were very clearly labeled placebo pills yeah. um so no deception there at all um what they found was that actually just taking those placebo pills um actually produced a clinically significant um improvement in their pain and what was amazing was that this didn't just last during the weeks of the trial, but then they followed up those patients five years later, and they found mm. that actually this understanding of the mind-body connection was still improving their um, levels of pain five years later. It wasn't a short-lived effect. Um, and so what I think that shows us is that actually we, we can create this kind of healing response ourself um, mm -hmm. by understanding the mind-body connection. It's like, uh, I think like uh, the ritual sometimes of taking a tablet is really important, 
um, even if it's a placebo mm. pill, because you feel like you're being cared for. And that might be one reason for it. But I think actually just having this positive expectation that your pain relief is controllable, that that could also be quite powerful in producing these benefits. And then subsequent studies have kind of asked, well, you know, it works with open label placebos, but can we just get rid of the pills altogether? Just by like talking to patients and explaining to them like how their expectations might heal recovery and getting them to set realistic, but kind of optimistic um, expectations. Yeah. And they found that that was really powerful, even with people's recovery from kind of serious heart surgery, that they recovered more quickly. And they also showed kind of changes in their physiology, such as reduced um, levels of inflammatory cytokines as mm. a result of that intervention. So, I mean, it's really powerful. And I think this is how medicine needs to use the placebo effect now, not by kind of lying to patients, like that's not ethical, but yeah. just by actually helping to incorporate the expectation effect into each treatment. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because something that I, I think about a lot, I write about, you know, on my Substack and everything, it's just the, the American healthcare system, because something that I've realized is, you know, and I think a lot of Americans do, is that this is just get people in, get people out, right? It's all just like boom, 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 right? And I have been very fortunate to find a primary care doctor, um, like for the last, probably had it for like five years, where she actually sits down and takes the time with me right like I whenever I'm like you know singing my doctor's praises I, I always talk about how when I go there for an appointment she's always late but I'm never mad because I know that she's probably talking to people mm -hmm. at length the way she talks with me and that's so beneficial and kind of like with what you're you're talking about with if we just explain it to people right and and reading books like yours is very helpful I've I've realized that with myself the more I understand about just the world in general has helped me in a variety of different ways, whether it's, you know, this stuff or psycho, uh, psychology, mental health, whatever it is. And one thing I loved about the book, and it's, you know, because I do a lot of advocacy work for, you know, uh, addiction and everything is you talk about how placebos might actually be able to help with like the opioid crisis. And you touched on something there, like this idea of just like being cared for and things like that. And when I first started learning about just the body responses and like dopamine and everything, it clicked for me. And, you know, one of the things as a, as a drug addict, when I was in my addiction and I ran out of drugs, right? I call my dealer and he'd be like, oh, I'll be there in five minutes. He takes like two hours. But as soon as I knew he was getting close, boom, my body started to calm down, right? I started to get a little euphoria before I even took the damn thing, mm -hmm. right? So when it comes to pain management, the opioid epidemic, because, you know, a lot of this started in the United States with that direct to consumer marketing saying like Oxycontin isn't that addictive and all that. How do you see, you know, the placebo effect and pain management helping to decrease the amount of like addictive medications that we're giving to people? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of promise here. And I've seen a few studies, I mentioned one of them in my book, but there have been, you know, moving so fast that there have been more, um, that have been published since that showed that actually open label placebos can help to wean people off of um, addictive kind of painkillers. Um, so what they did actually was a bit like the study I described previously. So they were, you know, open label, the participants knew exactly what they were taking, but they'd also boosted this effect by, um, by using this process called conditioning. So uh, what happened was for a few days at the start of the trial, the um, patients took their regular painkillers along with the open label placebo, along with um, a kind of, they just sniffed like a, a kind of um, swab of, um, that like absorbed, of, I guess cotton wool that had absorbed like a strong scent of cardamom. Mm -hmm. uh, then after a few days, they were encouraged, they weren't forced, but they were encouraged to just ditch the actual original pills and to just take the open label placebos along uh, with the smell. Yeah. And what they found was that that kind of conditioning, the association of the strong smell with the painkillers, that that actually amplified the benefits of the open label placebos. So it's really, it really did help them to reduce the amount of pain medication they were using. Um, you know, because now they were just relying on the brain zone, endogenous opioids. And so that actually helped them through rehab for their injuries. And the hope is that if you could do that quite quickly, people won't get addicted to the pills in the first place. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of promise there. We do need uh, bigger trials, but I do think those are happening like all the time. And, you know, I haven't seen any negative 
results here, actually. So I really think that there's, they might have to refine the techniques, but I really think like this is such a promising direction for the research to take. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. It's it's something that, you know, I, I, I think about a lot because when when I was I was personally in my addiction, like, you know, I was I was mainly taking them to get high, but after a while, like they weren't even doing anything for pain. Like when I would actually have pain, they weren't even doing anything. But then I started realizing like these pain medications, they were mainly just, you know, giving me a, a sense of euphoria, but they weren't attacking the cause of the pain, right? Like if I have a back injury, it's not gonna fix my back. It's not gonna fix my muscles. It's not gonna fix my spine. Like there are uh, medications that are like muscle relaxers, but like an actual opioid isn't getting to the root of that problem, you know? So, so it's, it's, it's this strange thing because so many people get hooked from getting these medications for pain, but it's not even tackling that specific problem. So if we can create that effect without giving the medications, but you know, speaking of pain and these placebos, one ethical question I'm always thinking about was, I can't remember if you touched on this in the book, but there was a, a surgeon, I think he, he worked on like basketball players knees or whatever, but they were doing like, you know, uh, like torn ligaments, like that kind of like invasive kind of uh, surgery. But he started wondering like, how effective is this? So he started going in and not actually doing the surgery, but he would like drill the holes in their knee where it looked like they did. And they recovered just as well. So that's the ethical question I'm always thinking of. Cause you have like these open label placebos and all that. It's like, okay, cool. But this involves actually like puncturing skin you know, so I'm curious your thoughts around like, you know, that like the, the pill sort of placebo and then like a placebo surgery. What what mm. are the conversations around that type of stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's loads of research showing that actually <laughs> like placebo surgery is really potent. And one of the reasons for that is that um, uh, in general, like, you know, it's good you know, like when you take a pill, you feel like you're getting kind of the care you need. And you can kind of have this idea that the chemicals are kind of changing your body in some way. But actually, mm -hmm. it's really easy to visualize what surgery is doing to kind of relieve a mechanical problem, you know. So that ease of understanding and visualization actually does mean that often surgery is an incredibly potent placebo. Now, in the past, actually, unlike drugs, surgical procedures didn't need to go through um, controlled clinical trials, part of, mm. because of the uh, ethical questions that you raised, you know, like, it's difficult to justify giving someone a kind of sham procedure where you're actually puncturing the skin and maybe, you know, raising the uh, slight risk of like a complication or an infection. Um, mm. The problem, I, I actually now think that the evidence shows that that is unethical, that to not have the placebo is unethical, because what's happened is that we've now found that lots of surgical procedures probably don't have any benefits above yeah. and beyond the placebo effect. Um, and so we, we're actually, rather than just having a small clinical trial where you're trying to compare uh, the two to find the result, what's actually happening now is that worldwide, you know, millions of people are on, undergoing surgery that isn't really having any direct um, physical benefit to them, that it's all coming from a placebo effect. Um, and, you know, one of the most controversial, but, um, I think it is a solid result, though we do need more research, is that actually the um, uh, installing stents to relieve angina, mm. now it seems that um, it, most, if not all, of the pain relief that people get from that and the benefits for their kind of exercise and lifestyle comes from a placebo effect, not from the surgery itself. And, you know, that is such a common procedure. So, you know, I really think actually this is something that needs to be explored in detail with like really rigorous research to make sure that people aren't undergoing surgery um, unnecessarily because there are other ways then rather than undergoing surgery that yeah. um, doctors could try to like use an expectation effect to achieve the same results. Yeah, yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I just started a, a new book. I think it's called For the Common Good. It's more of an academic book. I think it was like released through Oxford University Press or whatever. But it's all about these ethical questions around like uh, medicine, right? And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking about, you know, the COVID vaccines and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Because you you talk about like the nocebo effect. And maybe that'd be, that'd be interesting to touch on, right? So we have a lot of people who don't want to get the vaccine. And you have people talking about, you know, these side effects, these spooky side effects. There's been stuff, I don't know if you ever saw this, like on TikTok, there were like, people who were like, oh, look, I'm having like a seizure after I got it and everything. But 
the nocebo effect does the exact opposite. And you have a whole section on like mass hysteria and all that kind of stuff. So with, you know, specifically to like the COVID vaccine and the people who are, you know, anti-vax or vaccine hesitant, do, do you, do you see the nocebo effect like taking place? How does that happen? Uh, how does, you know, just thinking about it and how our, our inner circles are talking about these types mm -hmm. of things, how's that affecting us physiologically? And could that be making worse outcomes that then make people like more afraid to get things that could be helpful? Yeah. So, I mean, the nocebo effect is super common. And like you say, it's when, you know, it's the opposite of the placebo effect in a way. It's when we expect um, to experience some kind of illness or side effect from a drug, then we do experience it. And like the placebo effect and like the other expectation effects I mentioned, you know, it's coming from this mind body connection where like um, we might be kind of increasing uh, inflammation in the body, but with these negative expectations, because, um, you know, maybe if you're expecting to be injured, then it's good to have a bit of inflammation that can help to kind of attack pathogens before they manage to take hold. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it can it cause things like headaches. Like I've experienced that, that myself with my, um, antidepressant medications that mm. um you know like i had read the side effects it said like you might um, have yeah. quite a good chance of having headaches and i did um they were really bad migraines and then just as a coincidence i was reading a paper on the nocebo effect and you know specifically about antidepressants and i kind of saw that this was coming from ex my expectations and that realization kind of cured me of the headaches but you mm. know i know that those headaches were like totally real they're not imagined symptoms like yeah. the pain was just as real as anything else i've experienced and and we now actually know from the studies that that's caused by the release of different chemicals in the brain that can change the dilation of your blood vessels just like a normal headache it's just mm -hmm. the cause is the root cause of what's um leading to those changes is your expectations rather than say the actual chemical effect but yeah so they're really common you know i've had them myself this isn't something that we should ever like dismiss as just not being a real kind of sickness because like the symptoms are real it's just the cause is like psychogenic um uh but I, I think like in terms of the covid vaccines actually um if you compare the kind of two arms of the trial so the placebo arm and the people receiving the active vaccines what you find is that there is a higher rate of side effects in the people receiving the active vaccines so there is something there you know when the vaccine is stimulating the immune system, it can cause you to get fever, to get headaches, to feel fatigue, like mm -hmm. no question about that. But you do also see a lower rate, but still really significant, about 20% of patients in the placebo arm also experience um, those side effects too. So I think, I think the figures are roughly 20% compared to 40%. So half of the people uh, reporting side effects like headaches or fatigue you know, like they may be caused by their expectations. And I do think that possibly like our discussion of these in the, on social media, you know, like it's been really common for people to be tweeting about how wiped out they are by their uh, side effects. You know, that could over time kind of amplify the likelihood because if you know that everyone else is experiencing this, you're more likely to experience it too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because now that we're talking about it, like, uh, I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in in some of the uh, the early groups of getting the vaccine um, here in the states. So when I first got it, there wasn't really much stuff out there about side effects, right? Like when I got it, I had like the first dose, like my arm was like sore the next day, like that was it. Second dose, absolutely nothing. Still need to go get my booster and all that. But there wasn't anybody talking about it because I was really early on so that's kind of interesting to think about because i'm wondering like if that affected anything but you know one of the last things i want to ask about this kind of nocebo and all of that is we live in a time where way too many people go to like webmd and like look up stuff right but you can also look up medications like i i personally have to look up medications before i take anything because i got to make sure it doesn't have any kind of like narcotics or anything like that in it but like if you had a if you had a friend Right. If you had a friend and you know all about the expectation effect because you've been researching this book, like, well, how much would you tell them to like look into this stuff? Right. Because we want to be informed about what we're putting in our body, but it also might cause, like you were talking about, like getting a migraine, you know, and while kind of reading about the side effects and everything like that. So, 
should people be doing these deep dives into all the terrible things that might happen from taking a medication or should they kind of only look into it a little and not go like down some crazy rabbit hole Mm, yeah I mean so doctors actually do they're kind of developing some procedures where like you know even in your consultation um that they can be like uh they could give you the option they'll be like do you want to know about the side effects or Mm. do you not I think they always have to tell you about the really rare but um or serious potentially serious side effects like you have to know about some risks you know Mm -hmm. because you have to know the warning signs to look out for and there's no way around that but I do think with stuff like headaches which often are caused by nocebo effects maybe you know like you could just choose like not to look into that too deeply and just kind of you know if you start to experience anything unusual then you can start looking to see if it's a problem uh to go to your doctors so mm. I'd say you know if you're happy with that kind of level of uncertainty then I would say you know don't look into it too much if you do kind of want to stay informed and I think I generally do want to be as informed as possible I still mm. think um again that just kind of a knowledge of the nocebo effect can be really helpful like it was for me when I was experiencing yeah. these migraines that actually just opening my mind to the possibility that something was awful wasn't happening to my brain um but it was just my beliefs um mm. that in itself actually proved to be incredibly effective at like um neutralizing the nocebo effect and there have been studies showing that that like just educating people about it can be really helpful um also I'd like just look at the probabilities and kind of try to reframe them so if you read that like 10% of people get headaches um or get migraines that sounds like quite a lot you can really focus on that as like sounds like quite a high probability um you can present exactly the same information in a different way and say 90% of people um are side effect free um now again uh you know like that it's the same information but actually that positive framing just helps to emphasize you and reassure you that like the chances are you're going to be fine um Mm -hmm. and just that kind of thinking can be quite effective too so yeah I'd almost say like just be a little bit analytical about kind of what you're reading um and don't catastrophize um so you know like don't kind of just look at the uh, what's potentially like a small risk and then look for signs of that in you know your experience and then kind of go on from there to kind of start kind of going into these spirals of like catastrophic thinking like maybe just pull back a bit and get yeah. reassurance from your doctor if you can um just like ha- ask for their advice and hopefully they'll be able to tell you a little bit more about kind of the pe- uh, potential causes of what you're feeling yeah yeah I think that's I, I think there's a, a certain level of like self-awareness and knowing like you know uh what what type of thinking that you have and like are you somebody who catastrophizes and all that because you know I think a lot of the listeners and people like you and I like when we look into stuff like we'll we'll go and we'll like look at the probabilities and look into a little bit more information but even with like the spread of misinformation like people will just read headlines and freak out and but me if it's something that I'm not willing to dive into too deeply I don't hold a strong belief on it right but if it is something that I'm going to go research a ton and help educate myself on it then you know it, it changes my uh, views and the probabilities, for example, like when they're talking about uh, vaccine side effects or like severe vaccine side effects, like I was just listening to that recent Joe Rogan podcast with Peter McCullough, where, the mm-hmm. time where he's like really like all over the place with that stuff and talking about it. But, you know, I was like, okay, well, let me do some additional research on this stuff. And, uh, and even still with vaccine severe side effects or potential like fatal things, it's like one out of like hundreds of thousands or millions of people, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to look into that, be like, how afraid or worried should I be of this? And if the probability is extremely low, then I try to flip it like you're saying and look at the opposite side of that. But one thing I I did want to make sure that we were able to touch on because I listened, I I was listening to the book because even though you sent me a PDF copy, I, I have this app that changes it to audio Mm. I was listening on my morning walk so you talk about food you talk about exercise and that's where I was like oh man there's so much new great stuff that I've never even heard of so one thing one thing that I thought was absolutely insane was I've heard of that dude that you talk about like uh what's his name Malazan where he had like amnesia um, amnesia where you can only remember like Mm. for like a very small amount of time but he was like perpetually like able to eat or not eat and all that so anyways, I'm explaining that terribly. Can you talk about how 
like I've been doing the trick that you mentioned, like remembering what I ate to kind mm -hmm. of lower my hunger and my appetite. So can you, can you kind of talk about how our memory affects our appetite and that research? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I still feel like this is very much an expectation effect, even if it doesn't immediately sound like it. And I'll explain why. But yeah, so the first signs that like our brain is kind of influencing our feelings of hunger quite significantly came from this amnesic patient who's he's um, Henry Malaysian or HM in the literature. Um, and, you know, so he suffered from this form of amnesia where he couldn't form new memories. So he could remember bits and pieces of his past, but um, he couldn't like a uh, minute to minute, he couldn't remember anything that was, you know, that just happened to him. It's like, you know, um, he was stuck in the researchers say like a permanent present tense um, from when he had his operation to um, to the day he died. Like there were no new experiences kind of uh, being stored in his brain. And, you know, this included his meals. And what they found was that, um, well, what they kind of were asking was like, does our stomach, and we have sensors in our stomach that can kind of tell us if the muscles are being stretched, you know, if the lining is being stretched, that can kind of roughly tell us if we've got food in our stomach or not. But how powerful is that in actually shaping our appetite? And HM's experience uh, suggested like it's not very powerful at all. And that a lot of our appetite comes from our memories of when we've eaten and our expectations of hunger. Because what they found was they, um, they gave him a meal um, he ate it, then they took the plate away and they gave him another meal. And, you know, if he was like, had this feeling uh, coming from his belly that he was full, uh, he just wouldn't have really eaten it. Like, you know, he would have been like, I don't know why, but I feel really full. I'm going to go now. But he ate mm -hmm. it. And then they took that plate away and they gave him a third. And he was about to kind of tuck into that too. Uh, but the researchers decided like three meals and one hour was maybe a bit much, so they yeah. kind of took it away and didn't let him have have all of that plate too. But um, yeah, so that really showed that actually, like uh, our brains, like there's a huge cognitive influence in interpreting the signals from our stomach and forming this kind of feeling of appetite. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, memories are were important for, or the lack of memories was really important for. Uh, HM and other amnesic patients. Um, but what we find actually is that it's very much true for normal people as well. So if when people are encouraged to like actively remember what they've just eaten, um, then they tend to have like lower appetites later in the day. So they'll like snack less uh, than people who um, haven't been uh, prompted to kind of think about that specific memory. Mm -hmm. And I, I just see this as like being another form of the expectation effect because the memory of the meal is increasing your expectation of being satisfied and then that's shaping your behavior. Mm -hmm. And we actually find that things like food labeling can, you know, have similar effects. So if foods are labeled as being like very filling and satisfying, then we actually um, do experience less hunger later in the day compared to if exactly the same food is presented to people where it's labeled as this kind of low calorie health snack. Um, mm -hmm. And what's even more amazing is that's not just subjective, but it actually then seems to have this knock on effect to uh, people's hormonal response and kind of how quickly the food passes through their gut. If you, if you don't think you've eaten very much, the food actually just passes through you much more quickly. And that in itself is then going to shape your kind of feelings of hunger a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's mind body again. Um, and it, it actually shows that, you know, our expectations are super important in maintaining a healthy weight. Yeah, yeah, you, you discussed that in the book, like, you know, there's a difference between you know, uh, like mindlessly like snacking on like chips or whatever while you're watching TV because you're not thinking about it and actively remembering it. But when I first got into like mindfulness med uh, meditation, one of the things that I learned was like mindful eating, right? Like really slowing down, noticing like all the sensations that, you know, the, the feel, the texture, the taste and all these other things and slowing down and how that kind of helped control my appetite. So when you were talking about some of the science behind that, I'm like, uh -huh, that kind of, you know, makes sense because I'm paying more attention to what I'm actually sitting down and eating. But one of the other things you touched on in that section, so I would love it if you could like break down a little bit was how poverty kind of affects expectation and food, right? So, so how does that work? If you're, if you're low income, if you're living, you know, uh, paycheck to paycheck or even worse and struggling to put food on your table, keep your lights on, keep a roof over your head, how is that affecting like our weight and, you know, what we're eating and how hungry we are and all that? 
So, yeah, I mean, so this really relates to this kind of expectation of scarcity. So what mm. um, research from about 10 years ago had looked at was, you know, if you give people kind of a milkshake and you tell them it's like low calorie, you know, quite insipid, but it's, you know, going to make you lose weight, that that creates this kind of sense of deprivation that then changes the expression of the hunger hormone ghrelin. So the more ghrelin you have, the hunger, the more hungry you feel. And what they found was that actually people who had been led to have this sense of deprivation had higher levels of ghrelin. Um, ghrelin is also important because it seems to kind of adjust our metabolism. It's not just hunger, but it's actually more like um, changing our energy balance. So that if you feel kind of that you're going to be deprived of foods, it seems to slow down your metabolism. And like you kind of Ooh. spring fat, basically, because you don't want to waste like your energy if you're not sure that you're going to get enough. Um, now, what later researchers did in um, a study in Korea was that they actually tried to manipulate people's sense of their kind of social status within the society. So they, um, I can't remember exactly how they manipulated this, but they kind of made people feel like they were lower, they occupied a lower rung on a kind of the social ladder and mm -hmm. got them to kind of really uh, like ruminate on that fact and like the consequences it was going to have for them and their prospects and their kind of wealth later on. Um, then they gave uh, these participants a milkshake and measured their ghrelin levels. And what they found was that actually after that manipulation, when people felt kind of poor and vulnerable and like that they might face deprivation, that they also had higher levels of um, ghrelin, even though like the manipulation of their expectations wasn't specifically about food. It was more about social vulnerability. It had the same effect as like with the... Um, kind of uh, insipid and low calorie milkshake. And I think that's really important, but it also ties with loads of uh, studies of animals that show that actually this is quite an old response that your perception of like where you are in like the group's pecking order actually mm -hmm. does change like your things like your metabolism, the lower and you're eating, like the lower that people are on um, or animals are even you know, primates or even some birds are in their kind of social rankings, like the more likely they are to eat when food is available and the more likely they are to put on weight. And that's because like, if you're in a vulnerable situation and you don't know, like if you're going to be able to get resources in the future, you might have to make the most of what you have now. Mm -hmm. And so I think in our obesogenic society, that's really important because, you know, like all of these signals that we're getting about like our value to society or whatever could be prompting this kind of response. I think what's interesting about that is kind of like the self-fulfilling prophecy of it too. Like if if you feel like, oh, I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. So I'm going to overeat right now. Right. But then again, food costs money or resources or whatever it is. So then you're spending more of what you barely have. And then you like stay down there because you're constantly buying more. And, you know, because then your fridge is always going to be empty if you're living like lower status or at least feel like you do. So that's, that's something else that's kind of interesting to think about, but yeah. you know, um, with just a few more minutes of your time, one, one, one last thing I want to ask you, there's so much in the book that we didn't even get to touch on, which is why everybody needs to go get it. But People like you and I, right? I sit here, I'm like, I am a scientifically thinking, rational human being. And people who do rituals or believe in superstitions, they are just bonkers, crazy. Like that is ridiculous. You need to, you need to find things based in science. But you have a whole section in there about the expectation and these like rituals and superstitions. So then I'm like, okay, maybe these people are actually acting a little bit smarter than I am. And maybe I need some rituals. So how how can you know a, a ritual or superstition actually help somebody yeah so i mean there's two kind of mechanisms that work together um so i think but i think it all depends on this um sense of the kind of resources you have around you and like in a way like a superstitious belief or ritual kind of just gives you this feeling that like you have more resources at your disposal even if it's like uh from a paranormal source you know if you believe that fine um but I think what, what we're looking at here is, again, like how the prediction machine is like looking at its kind of mental resources um, and like, you know, and also how it can deal with stress. And in both cases, it's like if you feel like you've got a lot at your disposal, like the, the brain is kind of allowing the body and even like um, kind of controlling the energy supply to back to the brain itself. It's allowing you to have kind of more glucose to be released into the bloodstream. You know, it's allowing you mm. to kind of 
devote more um, to the task because like it's it's not so worried about kind of reaching exhaustion if you've got like help if help is at hand you know what I mean um, so like uh, so these these superstitions are kind of just helping you to feel a bit more prepared they're kind of increasing your sense of discipline they're increasing the kind of uh, flow of glucose within your blood they're doing all of this good stuff and they're helping you to reappraise your stress as well because mm -hmm. what might have seemed threatening if you've got like a kind of magic spell behind you is actually like not so threatening it's more of a kind of positive challenge that you feel that you can achieve and so that actually then increases and improves performance in all kinds of fields so on cognitive tests but also on um, you know sports like a uh, basketball uh, free throws um, they are like uh, more accurate when people perform their pre-performance rituals you know um uh they there was one study looking at karaoke singing and if people performed mm. a ritual before that they were more accurate with their singing because they had more mental focus you know like all powerful changes across the board um now what i love about this research is that it's like what they uh, actually found is that a bit like the open label placebo is like you don't have to kind of believe in something that's not true for rituals to have an effect yeah. um it's almost like just knowing that something is a ritual um kind of just gives you the sense that you've got kind of more resources at your disposal um so with the karaoke study for example you know they perform this crazy ritual that no one really believes is like um it's going to produce any kind of magic effect it was like draw a picture of yourself sprinkle salt on that picture screw yeah. it up throw it in the trash and then sing um, and the right. people did it and they scored like about 13 percent higher on the uh kind of karaoke machines like uh measurements of their singing you know like it and you know like considering like you know their performances weren't pitch perfect to start with it was it was like a significant change you know um so yeah i i feel like for me personally like this has just shown that actually like you should we can actually all incorporate rituals into our life without believing in magic you know mm -hmm. um Beyonce like does a series of uh, specific stretches before each performance. And I feel like that's something that we could all do, you know, before a presentation or something, just like um, have like set a certain warm up that you practice like in a specific schedule and routine. So it feels kind of, uh, it feels regimented and it feels meaningful, you know, um, just yeah. that kind of thing could be really helpful in our lives. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes me think there's so many because uh, I read a lot of books on like debunking like bad science and I was thinking about like the power pose thing where that like, uh, I forgot what her name was, she got really famous off of, you know, the power pose makes you more confident. I'm like, well, based on what I know about the expectation effect and stuff, it seems like, hey, maybe doing that before you go and uh, do a present, uh, uh, presentation, it'll make you more confident and you go out there and, you, yeah. you know, you do your thing. So yeah, some of these rituals could definitely help. And, and yeah, David, like I said, there's so much in this book. I absolutely loved it. So for uh, we're recording this uh, mid-December. So for everybody who wants to get their hands on this book, there's two separate release dates, one in the UK, one in the US. Can you let everybody know when the expectation effect is coming out? Yeah, so if you're in the UK or Australia or any kind of Commonwealth country, then it's coming out in on the 6th of January, 2022. Um, if you're in the US or Canada, it's coming out on the 15th of February, 2022. And will it be available in audio format as well for all my audio listeners out there? Or is that mm. going to be later down the line? Uh, no, it should be. I think that's already recorded. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. And and for everybody who wants to follow you, because you also, you know, you publish articles and things like that. Where's the best place to find you? Uh, yeah. So my website is um, davidrobson.me. And that's regularly updated with my kind of portfolio. Uh, but also on Twitter, D underscore A underscore Robson. Beautiful. Awesome, David. It was a pleasure having you on again. And yeah, I, I hope this book gets as much love and praise as it deserves. Uh, thank you.